Good evening. Welcome to the West Jordan Planning Commission meeting for September 1st, 2015. We do have all seven members of the commission present tonight. We have one item on our consent calendar, which is a minute from our August 18th meeting. Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Jacob, second by Commissioner Green. Any discussion to that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7 to 0. Our first public hearing is the view at 5600, uh, considering a preliminary site plan, preliminary to subdivision plat, and a preliminary development plan in an MFR and an HFR zone. Uh, the view at 5600 LLC, you wish the land company is the applicant. Is the applicant present? The time is yours. Good evening. Uh, I'm way excited to present this uh, project to you. Oh, is that, did that cut out? Oh, there. Anyway, uh, way excited to present this project. Is that? It's the peas. Hear me now. Apologize. Anyway, anyway, again, we are very really excited <laughs> to present this project. Uh, one of the reasons is that we do have a great project. We believe that. But uh, it's been a long time since we initially uh, presented the concept to the city. Uh, matter of fact, when we did that initially, Scott was the one that was assigned to us. And he's left the city and come back now. So that's how long it's been. <laughs> so anyway, uh, moving forward. Before we jump into that, sorry, can we get your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dennis Hepworth, with you into land. Thank you. And uh, my partner, Gardner Crane, will be uh, summing things up at the end. Thank you. The location and summing for the project. The project is uh, a component part of the Highlands, a uh, master plan project that has already been approved. You can see that it's in the... Uh, southeast corner of that uh, master plan project. The uh, first part of it is in an MFR zone, which has a base density of 4.4, excuse me, 4.51 development units per acre, and you can uh, buy up to a maximum of nine units per acre. North of that MFR zone is the clay hollow wash that segregates that zone from the uh, another zone to the north. And that zone is the HFR zone, which has a base density of uh, 9.01 units with a maximum buy-up of 18. next to the project, uh, first of all to the west is the Mountain View Corridor, to the south is a regional detention pond, a charter school, to the east is a single family subdivision, a multi-family project, to the north is uh, commercial development, uh, the base uh, project is Smith's, there's additional construction currently going on. And, and then uh, vacant ground, which will eventually be developed into additional commercial property. So to summarize uh, the highlights of this location and zoning, it is, again, part of the Highlands project, which has already been approved. It is subject to the West Side Planning Area standards, which, uh, as you'll see, have been met. It is well buffered. It has great access to uh, traffic channels nearby with the Mountain View Corridor 5600 West. And it is uh, very close to all of the commercial growth to the north. Okay, the scope of the project. Again, uh, the south portion of it is in the MFR zone. We have, it has 6.01 acres, and we are proposing 51 units. 
at 8.5 units per acre, which is below the maximum density. The north portion of the HFR zone has 28.79 acres, 480 units, and 16.7 uh, units to the acre, which again is below the maximum. The project will be built in five phases. The first phase is, is uh, all in the MFR zone. You can see the uh, building and structure count there to the left. That is the area that contains the clubhouse, swimming pool, spa, lazy river. Second phase is uh, to the north. Third phase is a little further west. Fourth phase, furthest west, and then to the north is the uh, fifth phase. So to summarize uh, that section, there are the two zones. Again, MFR, which is medium density to the south, high density to the north, and it's divided by the clay hollow wash, which we'll uh, get into uh, some of the amenities that we've uh, added to that area. And it, of note, it is uh, not subject to the annual cap that the city has on multifamily uh, projects because uh, the request has been vested. Buildings and structures. There is a typical elevation, colored elevation. Uh, the materials will be uh, those listed on the left, the, the stucco, hardy lap siding, hardy board and batten, uh, brick and stone veneer. So a good mixture of uh, quality uh, surfaces. There's an elevation of the clubhouse. Floor plan of the garages. So to summarize uh, the building and structures, uh, you'll, you'll see in the staff report that we got a positive recommendation from the DRC. We believe that we have great architectural character and consistency throughout the project. Uh, the parking is screened very well, and there are no structures within the floodplain, which is the clay hollow wash. You, even though uh, you'll see that we are uh, proposing to pipe that, we still have avoided uh, putting any structures in that area. Improvement and amenities. So this chart helps uh, you see uh, what's necessary to get the density that we're proposing. We need approximately 88% buy-up in order to do that. The proposed density buy-up options, uh, the first section is trails and open space. You can see that we've offered uh, amenities that actually add up more to more than the 22%, but the ordinance uh, restricts us to 22%. That includes a uh, laser river, a uh, swimming pool, a parkour course. You can see here uh, with the landscaping plan, the uh, clubhouse there to the left, the swimming pool, the lazy river. Up in the northwest corner, this is a park area that has a trail system in it, that has fitness stations and a parkour course, has a pet park, This is the uh, tree colonnade and courtyard where you uh, visually see it from the uh, east side of the project. Then we have, uh, we're proposing an additional 15% for the installation of uh, items along the trail corridors, an additional 15% for additional trails. There's the uh, that area to the right there is uh, a buffer area that we're asking for additional points for. And then the clay hollow wash, since we're piping it, we're proposing to 
turf that so that it's extra usable open space. There's additional space in the wash. Additional points from the uh, street design. There's an example of uh, our entry monuments. Again, there's the uh, Buffett area along 5600 West. Smart growth for uh, detached garages. Additional points for building design. For a total of 112%. And again, you notice that the chart suggests that we need 88%. So we've uh, got more than enough. And I know Larry's going to go over that. So to summarize the amenities and improvements, we'll have the first ever Lazy River in a project, the first ever parkour course, have great pedestrian traffic, fenced and landscape trail system, usable space in Clay Hollow Wash, and we will end up maintaining that open space privately or via the SAA. And again, Larry will go into more detail on that. And then just if we ended up needing more buy-up, we actually have more discretionary buy-up that we could use, but we obviously don't need it. So anyway, final note from my partner, and then any questions we'll be glad to answer. I was sitting here wondering what was going to happen to him when that uh, timer went to zero. <laughs> uh, do I get another ten minutes? <laughs> I don't. I don't need it. Uh, I'm Gardner Crane with Human Land Company. Uh, thanks for hearing us out, and thank you for your service to to your community. We. I don't want to sound trite, but we admire people that give their time to to serve the community. So thank you. Uh, we're here trying to trying to make money, so uh, we admire people that are uh, uh, community servants. Thank you. Uh, we I hope you can tell from this presentation that our goal is to make this the uh, hands down the nicest for rent project in the state that the state's ever seen. Um, the, some of the, many of those diagrams uh, didn't do it justice. Uh, we know that the delivered product is is going to be much nicer. Than, than we can depict in a meeting like this. Um, that's going to do a, a few things for your city, and I know that West Jordan City easily meets affordable housing quotas, stuff like that. You're not out looking for additional multifamily projects in the city. But I want to tell you what I think this project will do to benefit the entire city. Um, one, our, our fees alone to the city um, could be four to five million dollars. So, so revenue to the city will generate uh, a whole lot of property tax. Uh, the value of this project when it's built will be around $80 million. And so that there will be a huge property tax bill. And as you know, a lot of that comes to West Jordan City. On top of that, we'll be pulling uh, 531 households, uh, good quality households, to this area where you are uh, seeing some commercial growth. And that will generate a lot of sales tax uh, revenue. Uh, there will be a lot of dollars spent out in that area, uh, and as you know, a lot of that sales tax revenue comes back to West Jordan City. Uh, but one, one thing that a project like this uh, really can do for a city, which we've seen it do in other cities that many people don't, uh, uh, aren't aware of, um, this will be a very nice project when it's complete. It will be hands down the nicest project in West Jordan, and we will begin to draw people out of other projects in West, in West Jordan to this project. Those other projects will become aware of that. They'll, they, they are well aware of their competition. Uh, they'll be threatened by the, the new construction, nine-foot ceilings, granite countertops, the lazy river, all of the amenities that we're going to offer. They'll go to their bosses and say, hey, we're losing people to this fancy new project. We've got to do some things to upgrade our own project. And so, and we've seen this in other communities where we're, where we've delivered a new high-end project like this. Shortly thereafter, all of the surrounding projects are pouring money into their projects to upgrade them to remain competitive. And so, where West Jordan has a lot of multifamily, 
Yeah, we recognize you're not out looking for more. We know that this will be a, a, a we think, a great benefit to the city for that reason. You'll see all of your multifamily housing quality uh, step up to remain competitive. Uh, with the amenities that we're offering, the number of units, 500 units, uh, the other projects in the surrounding area and throughout the city will have to do something to try to compete. And I think you'll see all of the projects in the city uh, be improved. Uh, we, we completed a couple years ago a project similar to this in Layton, and, and we got feedback from the city. Uh, the, the, approving that project was the best thing they'd ever, ever done because four surrounding projects that had started to become uh, outdated, not as well maintained, as soon as we opened our doors and they started to lose people, um, all of them, four projects, invested one to three million dollars in their projects uh, to beautify them. They, they replaced countertops, granite countertops, they revamped landscaping, and so all of the product in, in that whole area was overnight uh, improved. So we, we believe that'll be the case. I think that'll even be amplified here uh, because uh, we're really pulling out all the stops on this and spending a, a lot of money on amenities to make this the nicest project in the state. Uh, we recognize that we're out here a little ways to the west, um, although there's been some really neat growth in the area with the corridor being in and Smith's beginning construction. We still know we have to offer something really special, you know, if you're out on 5600 West to, to pull people out there. And so that's our plan. Uh, do you have any questions for us? And, and we can pull Dennis back up here to help me fill them if you, if you have any for us. I think we do. Mr. Jacob. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a question for you on the, the fence that's on the east side of the property or the west side of 5600 West. Um, what, did I remember did that was a vinyl fence or what? Let me, let's make sure we know exactly which area you're talking about. Along 5600 West. Along 5600 West, yeah. There, there will be a slit rail, three foot fence on top of the fur. So okay. it's already going to be firm in order to create a buffer. So to add another large fence on it, <coughs> it right. wouldn't be uh, <laughs> and, and how high is the burn? They're typically vary from three to five feet. It'll be a landscape okay. to burn. It, you, Not eight or nine or ten feet, but right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that split rail is consistent with what else has been done in the Highlands and Longview and in some of the other areas so along the washes. Yeah, we we like split rail because it does provide a barrier, you know, a, somewhat of a deterrent for children. But at the same time, we don't want it to look like the Berlin Wall, you know, like 5600 right. West. Yeah, and that's why I was asking. Okay. I, think he, I wouldn't want to give you credit for a big landscape buffer if there's a fence right on the side. <laughs> so right. That makes sense. Okay. Back. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your presentation. Question for you, please, regarding the, the chronological development of the phases. So, indeed, you will go one through five as presented here. Uh, more, that's the plan. Now, let me tell you how, what, what could cause that to vary, and that's our financing requirements. And so, from a utility standpoint, construction standpoint, we've phased it according to best practices. Uh, but there's a chance that our lender may require that we begin construction on two phases at a time. Uh, but as far as the sequence goes, yeah, we plan to follow that sequence. Okay, great. If we Thank strayed you. from that, you know, we, rec we, we would comply with the city requirements to come in and, and gain an approval to stray from that sequence. But The main reason I ask is just to ensure that the amenities that you mentioned would be included in phase one are actually there. Of course, you have a vested interest to put them there to attract people to come sure. to your establishment, but just wanted to, to make sure because we've had some issue with that in the past and Where developments not putting in amenities. Amenities aren't getting installed. Well, in, uh, in this case, phase one and phase two has to go but we'd be I think we'd be happy to commit in the form of the development agreement to 
installing, you know, especially the clubhouse and uh, amenities in, in the, by the end of the second phase or something like that to uh, give the city assurance that that stuff will be installed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jacob. Thank you. I just remembered I had a couple other questions. <laughs> um, when the ranch way you mentioned, is that going to go in, uh, in, in phases as well, or will that be completed? And, and when, once it's completed, will that connect all the way up to the roundabout on 7800 South? Or does this scope of this project only bring it to the north end of this project? Yeah, currently, at so many years, we do phase one and two at the beginning. Only uh, the eastern portion of the window is where it When the other phases go in, the rest of the loop will get completed. But our project would only complete to where you can see. But it does, it is designed to actually connect to that kind of path. Right, but not as a part of this project. No. Okay. And then the other question I had was regarding the, the park at the north end of the of the uh, development here. Northwest the trails and the park over course and that kind of stuff. That would go in in phase five, I assume, right? Because that's where it is. Um, I was just I could actually what it consists of. I, I actually think there's a chance we'll accelerate that. That's such a nice amenity. Um, we haven't made a final determination on that, but uh, if our financing permits it, we may put uh, my uh, my objective, and I think Dennis would agree, would be to get that in as soon as possible because it's such an amenity. That benefits us. We have to lease up all these units, and if the amenity's there, it, you, we've got to spend the money anyway. If it's already there, it helps us. Right. So. Uh, what does know, that consist of? Other than the trails and the parkour course, is it grass? Is it... Natural grasses, which I like to call leaves. Can we, can we go to that page? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to go from that drawing. I'll let you answer it. So, so basically, while, you, while they're navigating to that, it'll have two components. How many of you, have, that you're going you're gonna to feel old if you don't know the answer to this question. How many of you have heard of parkour? I yeah. have. Yeah. All right, young guys, good. I can't do it. You've probably seen the younger generation do it, but there are all these obstacles that they they climb. Uh, you've all heard of Jackie Chan and his kind of stunts that he does. It's that type of stuff, uh, the art of movement kind of stuff. And so we'll have a bunch of obstacles uh, in a in kind of a course trail setting uh, along those lines. Now that's not for everyone. I you know uh, that's not for me. I can't I can't run up a wall and do a backflip off of it. But it's a huge thing with, with the uh, generation below us. Um, but we will also have, you've also probably all heard of a parkour, which is something totally different. It's something we can all do. Uh, it's also a, a trail system with exercise stations positioned periodically throughout the course, where, where you'll, you'll walk or jog and come upon a, a series of pull-up bars, and then go another distance, and there will be sit-up benches. Um, so it'll, it, the, the goal is to have, you know, an amenity that offers exercise and entertainment to a broad, you know, spectrum of generations. So a lot of that will be will be landscape. You can see the burning and trees. Some of it uh, will just be natural, it's just what's there. And, and the logic behind that is water conservation. People like to just kind of get out of the house and feel like they're up in the foothills. And, and if there are dogs with them and needs to take care of business, there's there's some open spaces uh, for their pets. That, did I do that justice? Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let, let me add, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner is a top lot. Uh, left of that is a pet park. So we've designed it so that adults can go and take their kids and their pets and still participate in this activity without feeling like they've got to get a babysitter for their kids. Great, thank you. Any other questions for the outfit? Yeah, we'll, oh. we'll go here. Oh. Mr. Uh, just a quick question. Um, as I'm looking at this uh, overlay here, it uh, looks like phase one has a traffic outlet, phase two has a traffic outlet. But then phases three, four, and five kind of all share the same outlet. 
is there any concern for kind of traffic issues as the further phases go on in getting, you know, traffic in and out onto Window Ranch Way? Actually, there is a third access point up in Phase 5. Right. I see the one in Phase 5, but it just seems like with Phases 3, 4, and 5, it seems like traffic kind of gets choked up in there. And I know that, you know, you have these different outlets. Is there any plan eventually for any kind of tie-in or anything if that could get, if that gets congested? To tie in Window Ranch Way to the north? Right. That will eventually go through. I suspect there's a chance that that will go through before we deal with Phase 5. This will probably take four or five years to build this project. So there's a chance it will already be in. But if it's not, you know, we'll comply with FIRE's requirements. They have all the ground space they need and the ground requirements to make sure the users have all the safety requirements. But you raise a valid concern until that third access goes into Phase 5. There will be a fair amount of people in Phases 3 and 4, you know, exiting out that original entry of the Phase 2. Right. Yes. Okay. The good thing is, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, is that these types of projects really generate a lot less traffic than people think. You know, there are a lot of families with one car. They typically, you know, there's traffic in the morning and kind of a flurry of traffic in the evening. But compared to a single family subdivision per household, these types of projects generate much fewer rolls or daily drives. So as construction commences of these, are you planning a separate construction entrance for construction crews and vehicles? Or are you intending for them to use the same access as the homeowners? No, more than likely we'll have a cobble, even by phase, we'll have like a cobble entry drive for trucks and stuff. So they're not, they're not, we don't want them intermingling with vehicle traffic. Okay. Thank you. And then, you know, the trucks can be part of our roads, as you know. Right. So yeah, we'll try to, we'll figure out a way to get trucks in and out of it. That would be the thing for the residents. Part of the reason we're very cautious of that, too, is with the residents, once they move in, we want them to be happy. So we'll stay. And so we fence off the construction areas, try to minimize noise, dust, stuff like that, because we want people to want to stick around. But even in phase one, we've got three to four years of construction in these phases. We've got to be smart and make sure that the impact is minimized. Otherwise, we'll keep people being in that phase one. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Heyer. Thank you. I'm a little bit too old for the parkour course, but that lazy river right down my alley. Tell me about that. I just whispered to Justin Peterson when he came in, and I said, I can't wait for all of us to celebrate the completion of this project by sitting in a tube and floating around in the lazy river. I'm a fan of those because there was one near my house, and I love to take my kids up there and tuck a little kid under each arm and float around in the lazy river. So it is, you know, what it sounds like. It's a swimming pool, and it has a channel that circulates water. So it's a circle, the pool area. Exactly. So you'd be able to sit in a tube and float around. That's going to be one of our marketing points. You know, I can see us having a billboard on I-15 with a picture of our lazy river and a happy father and his kids floating around. Yeah, you can see it right there. The pool is directly behind the clubhouse. Yeah, you know, I forgot about that pointer. Right there. So it actually connects to the pool. My hand's shaking. Probably not that much, but the laser would magnify it. It connects to the pool right there, and the water flows in a loop. Thank you. And those aren't cheap, but I think that was something I insisted on. These guys make fun of me over every once in a while. Commissioner Gray? I kind of answered my own question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. As we look at the parking plan 
I noticed that by the time we get to phase five, the parking required and provided matches. But my question is, is that as we compare, for example, phase five itself, in phase five, in that, in that area that would be phase five, you're required to have 200, it says we're required to have on your chart, uh, on the site plan, we're required to have 250 parking spots, but there's only 199 that are, that are provided in phase five. So obviously that leads me to believe that there's 51 parking spots someplace else that you expect those people to park in, and same with all the other phases. How, how is that going to work for parking if, if the ordinance requires, or the right, yeah, the ordinance requires 250 and you only got, and you're 50 short right around that phase? I guess I'm confused on that, how that's going to work. Well, that's another reason why we probably will have to stick to the order of phasing, where we have to do one, then two, three, four, and five, because we need, we do, you're right, we do need that parking. And if, if we did five before phase four, then we wouldn't meet that requirement. So, so that extra parking that you're asking about is probably in phase four. You can see, look at the uh, shape of phase two, for example. We've had to stretch that sort of geographically into the area of phase three in order to meet the parking requirement. And then you get into phase three, and that sort of stretches into phase four and so on. So, but when, once you get phase four in, you've got more than enough parking, and that's where the excess parking for phase four, excuse me, phase five comes from. I, I guess my concern is, is that when you, when you look at the excess, when, when you look at the excess parking, particularly in phase four, it's all on the west end. So I, I guess I'm, I'm confused. I mean, I get that this meets the, the, the entire ordinance, but if that phase requires it, that means that there's 40 parking spots a whole heck of a lot away from the buildings. So is, is, is that something that we're concerned about or... <coughs> It just seems like it puts all your all your excess parking out in the in the West Forty, as if it were. Well, you know, let me let me address that. So we're our total required stalls is eleven sixty. Is that right, Dennis? Yes. Yeah. Um, for five hundred and thirty one units. So that's uh, two that's two stalls right per unit. Um, most cities require. Quite a few more stalls than are actually than there's actually demand for. Um, we we are one project we have up in Layton has about double the stalls of the quantity of units, and the parking lots always, especially during the day, almost about half full. And then at night when everybody's home, about a, you know about a third of the parking lot is still empty, available for visitors. So we we feel like by me meeting the ordinance, uh, we're still doing far more than there is actual need for, demand for. Uh, and so we'll, by phase, we're confident that there are plenty of, plenty of stalls, you know, per phase from a practical standpoint. But then on top of that, you know, by phase, we'll meet the ordinance, which again, we feel is, is uh, you know, it requires more stalls than practically is are, are actually used. I don't know if that point helps, but uh, we, we're just not worried about running out of parking stalls. Um, a lot of you know, probably half of these uh, households will have one car, but we've got two stalls, uh, more than two stalls per unit in the project. Did that, did that address your question? Yeah, kind of. Well, let, let me add one more note to it. Uh, every unit will have a car, excuse me, a car or a covered parking, and those stalls are close to the building. So, assuming that every unit or most of the uh, units do have one car, they will be uh, able to park really close to their building. And then, if they have two cars, they'll have 
to sort of negotiate that because it's on a first come first served basis and that will change daily you okay all right for the uh, garages considered in that parking total no they are actually extra parking spaces that that you'll notice the count on those there's uh, I believe 144 of them so there's not one per unit they're actually available for rent so if someone wants to rent uh, a garage they can so it could be additional parking space it, it, te technically it is and it's it's not part of the count the required yeah. count so it is extra any other questions for the applicant? Wonderful, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Arter. I think the applicant uh, described the project sufficiently, um, where it's at, what they're, what they're planning on doing, amenities. Um, I'll just add that it, um, I've gone through the, the buyout calculations for the density increase in the WSP and found that it uh, uh, meets that to where they are sufficient to meet the buy-ups as listed in the staff report. And the uh, site plan and subdivision, I found that they'd meet the criteria for approval, and so staff is recommending preliminary approval of this subject to the conditions of all three of the development plan, site plan, and uh, subdivision. Thank you, Dave. Just one question for staff. How does the timing of this uh, build out coincide with the uh, widening of 5600 West and the completion of that? Um, Nate, do you know when that portion of 56 is supposed to be right in front of it? I don't have an exact time frame, but it's something that we're, we're working on funding and design. I think it's in the next three to four years, but I don't have an exact date. You may know more than I do, Justin, and you're talking with Dave Murphy. Next summer. Next summer. So. It looks like it lines over I don't think it's started design yet, so next summer might might not be too realistic, but we could get back with you on that on a more precise date. Okay. The other question I had is, is that intersection on Window Ranch Way and 5600 West planning on being one another? Or another, right about another yes. One of those big old, yeah. I was afraid you were going to say that. Kyle said he just referenced the South Loop Road, so I just wanted to make sure I was talking about We'll call it a traffic circle, then, instead of a roundabout. We call them traffic movers, not stoppers, like red lights. I, I call it things people don't know how to drive around. <laughs> but that's another topic. I'm finished. Commissioner Gray. Uh, a couple of questions. In the staff report, bottom of page 7, top of page 8, it talks about the developer will be required to preserve the property, obviously, for that future roundabout. How do we ensure that that property is set aside? Is that part of this, this plan here? Yeah, part of the final subdivision plot. Okay. okay. And then the second, the second question I have is, as part of this, it looks like the three-story buildings are going to be 43 yes. feet and some change. So the, the question that I have is that the, the ordinance requires that the planning commission establish the heights. Do we have to put that in the, in the, uh, the final? Is that just part adopted as part of this report? Or it's part of the that? development plan. It's adopted okay. because there's a, an elevation in the development plan. Okay. So we don't have to put that in the wording of the... the, the, the no, with the approval of the development plan, you will be approving all of that. The okay. materials, uh, exteriors, heights, and so forth. And then my last question is, I know in some of the zoning, like the, the PC has got a maximum parking. This one's only got the required. Yes. Okay, we don't have a maximum in this zone either. No. Okay. Well, I think that I think that PC you're referring to, the Gardner Station, yeah. that was in the TSOD overlay. So that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, there are some places that have that. Yeah. No, no, not this one. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Very well. 
Uh, well, open the side of the public. If there's anybody who would like to comment on this particular item, we would invite you up to the podium. Uh, you'll have three minutes if you would kindly give your name and contact information if there's any staff needs to follow up if you want. Seeing none, we'll... Oh, all right then. Yes, please. Feel free to move that Pull your phone back in front of your hand. There you go. There we go. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Eric Hanna. I live at 8052 Ponds Lodge Drive. And uh, we had a couple of concerns. Uh, it seems like to me, um, and we fought this issue a lot, it's we don't have the facilities for this type of growth out there. Um, my concerns with uh, the development or the height, uh, the, I think it's Boulder Canyon was 30, 35 feet at the gable. These are like 10 feet higher than that. And it's sitting up higher on, a, on the plain. It's really imposing onto that Island Park neighborhood. The, uh, the access to the schools, the, uh, they planned, I think, a, a blinking light or something. For the, for the kids to cross 5600 West. And if any of you live out there, we've already lost kids on this road, died because of the added congestion. The other apartment complexes have added. I was on the ADP um, student council and we tried to establish safe walking routes and we could not do that. They put in, West Jordan put in a semi-quasi paved surface against the, the chain link fence for the kids to walk on in the winter after the plows came through and covered it with three feet of snow. They're not, they're not providing access to Fox Hollow. They're not providing access to the middle school up east. There's no access to the high school. And you're proposing bringing in maybe, what, two, three thousand students possibly? to an already overcrowded school. Hayden Peak has nine portables. Do you know how many a middle school can have, or a elementary? Nine. They're maxed. West Hills Elementary, or West Hills Middle, completely maxed. The high school, kids are complaining because they don't even have a seat to sit in sometimes. And we're, pro and we're proposing bringing in thousands more kids. We don't have the facilities yet for this. The charter school is not accepting anybody else. This doesn't seem like the place for more high density residential. It really doesn't. And I think there's a possible quota trying to be met with Smith's Marketplace. They were probably promised rooftops, if you will. And I don't, I don't think Smith Marketplace wants this type of traffic. I think they were hoping for more of a a single family home residence, somebody who, a family will go spend their food budget there. Anyway, thanks for your time. Um, I really want the council to reconsider this, the planning commission. And I'm really take the citizens in mind. Time's up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else like to comment? Please. Don Moss, I'm a resident um, on Ponds Lodge, 8108 South Ponds Lodge, a homeowner. Uh, my concern is another uh, high density uh, project coming into West Jordan. You were speaking regarding parking. Already another apartment complex close by, the spillover of the parking spills over into the street impacting homeowners. I'm not sure at this point what can be done because it's already been zoned as such and appreciate um, the presentation on a, on a project that they are explaining will be a high quality project. I'm hoping in your capacity and the capacity of the city that we put the trust in to help ensure that that's done. If there can be options that would help 
and alleviate some of the impact to the single homeowners, as was spoken, such as a, a greater buffer zone. You can see the way it's being built. Most of the um, impact is overlooking right on 5600 West, right into the single homes. If there was more of a buffer that could be done that would help the, the property owners, those who are more vested in the city and that have a long-term view, that would be appreciated. I know it's a um, difficult job that you have in weighing the parties and the people that have put the work into this. But you have a stewardship to the city also in protecting those who have the long-term view as opposed to, in this case, it looks like a nice project, but most of those individuals that are coming were more short-term transient type populations. And we already have a lot of that high density projects in West Jordan. I don't know if the city has been considering that as as compared to what other cities are letting in on their, their building and what our, our population in West Jordan is compared to other cities. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. I know you have a difficult job and, and, and we're already down the road with these have already been zoned as such. If you can just help in the monitoring and considering some of the buffers for the property owners, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to comment on this item? And close the public hearing. Uh, I can address I think, one of the issues that was presented. It was mentioned in our pre-meeting, and Larry backed me up on this one to make sure I get it right, that uh, the school district is considering uh, yes. changing the boundaries. Yes, sir. They're considering um, the boundaries going to Fox Hollow rather than Hayden Peak across 5600 West. Now, this is a consideration. I know it's a it's a process they have to go through, and so they will. But I've been in contact with the school district. And as far as schools um, go, the commission's fully aware that um, we have no control over over schools. In fact, the legislature's told uh, cities over and over again that you cannot condition development on the availability of schools. That's a state issue, and, and, and I'm just reiterating that. So. Thank you. Uh, what about the app came back up if you wanted to address any of the other concerns that were presented? I'll just address one, um, which is a, a viable concern. Uh, obviously, these uh, citizens have lived in the area for a long time and enjoy where they live and are concerned about the impact on them. Um, we've, we've tried to carefully plan this and locate, you know, we look all over the Wasatch Front for, for locations um, where, where we can minimize the impact. Um, and on this project, there, there is that, that one stretch, just, uh, where's your pointer, Dennis? From right here that is in the proximity of single family. But the buffer, uh, we will landscape this area. There will be berms like we've talked about. Uh, the distance doesn't look like a lot here, but it's 50 plus feet. We'll have to, we'll have to get an exact measurement from the, from the sidewalk. Then they'll have the width of 5600 west. And then these homes here back uh, onto 5600 west. Uh, and my memory is that most of them have six foot or so fences uh, buffering their backyards from 5600 West. So their concern obviously is legitimate um, when no one is excited about change. We all fear change, uh, but we're confident that their future good friends will will be people that, that moved into this uh, project. Um, I know that's been the case. We moved into a, an area uh, where there was a lot of opposition towards a single family subdivision by a certain attorney who's now a close friend of mine, and, he, and he's said to me, Gardner, I regret now that we opposed your subdivision because some of my best friends live there now. And so it's, it's natural to have fear of change, but they will, our experience has always been that down the road they make friends with people that move into these new projects that they wouldn't trade for, uh, you know, the open field that was there uh, in the past. Thank you. That brings it back to the commission for further discussion. You probably want to close the public hearing. We did. Oh, oh I didn't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> commission back. Uh, whoa, that's crazy. 
Mr. Ballard. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to mention from the Design Review Committee, uh, as contained in the staff packets, that I, I was grateful to be able to be in on that discussion. Uh, the, the two questions that, that I just wanted to, to bring up, just to make sure we're fine with, a deal with the fencing. As was already mentioned, there is a large stretch of vinyl fencing that's proposed. And, uh, I have a vinyl fence that borders an arterial street that looks like a, a war zone with kids throwing rocks. And, so I, just if that might be a concern. And then the other one, we had a, a good discussion on carports. There, there's going to be a lot of covered parking. And I know on the field trips that we've taken in conjunction with City Council, uh, we've had some good discussion on how to handle the coverings on carports. Do we want to make it a prominent point where oh, we were talking about how nice the structures have looked when it's been more of an A-frame. Uh, but then the developer was mentioning uh, and appropriately so during our, the design review committee meeting that sometimes it's nice to minimize the view of the car forts and then just kind of, kind of keep them lower key. Um, but, but we have found that that makes a big difference in the, the look and feel of, it, of a development, especially one as large as this would be with, with so many car forts. So I just wanted to bring that up to see if anyone had any uh, question on car forts or fencing. Um, and then I guess the last consideration, and Mr. Gardner already mentioned that, because to give due respect to Mr. Hanna's comment on schools, uh, unfortunately, uh, through state law, we, we can't make schooling a consideration for our decision uh, to, to approve or, or deny. The school district is tasked with being able to adequately service students, but yet they don't even say exactly how they're going to service the students, just as well. So that, that's a kind of a conundrum there. But uh, I just wanted Mr. Hannon to know that uh, we, we weren't, uh, you know, that, that, that we were aware of his concern too. Commissioner Green. First off, I want to thank the, the, the uh, two gentlemen for uh, taking the time and coming and talking to with us. Uh, just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, any vote that I make will be based on the fact of what, what the uh, city ordinance requires or allows. But I will address one question where, or one of your concerns, uh, and unfortunately we may or may not be able to impact it on this particular um, project, but the city council has heard the West Jordan citizenry's um, concern with high density housing and the number of units we had. Uh, the city council did put a cap and grade uh, requirement on this on the number of units and high density units. Unfortunately, this one was put was presented and started before that happened. So this one's basically been grandfathered before that ordinance took effect. So just to, just so that you understand that the, the city council and and other people, uh, particularly me, uh, fought some high density housing here not too long ago in my neighborhood. So I understand that. Uh, so uh, just understand that uh, my my I think my biggest concern, and I and I think I I voice some some sympathy with the residents here is that 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 area right along 5600 South, you're gonna have three story buildings, 43.3 feet, uh, and I'm gonna have to disagree with part of the criteria that says that it that it won't negatively impact the adjacent properties of the surrounding neighborhoods. I think that the I think that those buildings that are along 5600 West could be flipped someplace else so that it doesn't affect the, the neighbors to the due east. And so in my mind, uh, at least criteria two under the preliminary site plan, finding a fact, I'm gonna have a hard time supporting that the building heights and locations don't negatively impact the adjacent properties. Can I interject one thing? In the Westside Planning Area Code, it requires buildings to front arterial streets rather than parking lots. And so that was what, okay. like, just to answer your question, that's what has driven this design rather than having a parking lot fronting on the, the street. It's, it's more of that design base for buildings. And so it really does follow the, the Westside Planning Area Ordinance. But we could, we could swap the buildings and have a different site plan so that some of the green space uh, or, or additional green space may border 5600 west and shift it a little bit farther to the west impact the, the, the impact on the neighborhood, correct? 
Um, except I would have a concern with playing fields and maybe green space being that close to an arterial. That's my only concern. I'd have to look at that more intently than um, just... I think that the, the distance away from the neighborhood is sufficient enough that a 43-foot building, you know, while it's taller than the houses, it's not overpowering to them because you'll be 160 feet to the closest house. So. That's not 70 feet like the TSO. No, so. no. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Chairman. Chairman, Commissioner. 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 Chair. Um, there are a couple of things on this that, that give me a little bit of pause. Uh, one is that the, the street doesn't connect to anything. Um, <coughs> criteria 2 on subdivisions you know, talks about uh, adequate access to public streets to carry the type and quantity of traffic which may be generated. Uh, the traffic study this is over a year old, by the way, so I'm curious as to how applicable it still is now that 5600 West is complete uh, all the way through and widened all the way through. Um, I'm just curious as to how, well, it's widened everywhere north of 78. I shouldn't say all the way through. It's not widened, obviously, where this project is. Uh, so I'm concerned as to the the uh, adequacy, is that the word? The sufficiency of 5600 West to handle all of the traffic without being able to funnel any of it onto 7800 South until that piece is complete. So that, that concerns me a little bit. 5600 West is a lot more busy now than it was when this traffic study was done. And the traffic study says it's going to be a lot more busy when this is complete. And it's complete. Of course, the traffic study was written in August of 2014, so we have to take that into consideration. So that, that kind of gives me a little bit of pause as to, I think some of the traffic on this would need to head out to 7800 South. And 7800 South, by the way, well, while I'm spouting my wish list, should be widened to four lanes between the roundabout that exists and Mountain View Corridor. It squishes really quick there. So, um, if Mountain View Corridor is, is seen as, oh look, big, big, high capacity road, this subdivision or this apartment complex will be supported by this big, wide road, great, we got to get there. And to get there, you got to go on two lane road, which is 7800 South right now and 5600 West right now. Um, so that, that gives me pause for a moment. And s the second thing that gives me pause is, is the, uh, the, medium density section of this, like uh, Commissioner Green was mentioning. I'm not sure that this really meets the intent of a medium density zone on that partial. Uh, medium density MFR zones are meant to be a transitional buffer between higher density uses and the lower density uses. This is really just a high density use, just not, but it is, but it's not. Does that make sense? It's, no. I, I see, <laughs> thank you. It makes, it, it's a height, it's an apartment complex on a medium density zone. Now, granted, it's only a piece of an apartment complex, and you throw in the clubhouse and the swimming pool and a couple of fields to get your density down on that particular parcel. But I think when you throw it in with the rest of the development as a whole, you're looking at high density. Nobody's going to drive along 5600 West and look at those apartment buildings and say, oh, that's medium density. No, that's high density. Just ask the neighbors that just spoke. It, it looks like high density, it sounds like high density, but, it smells like high density, but you don't have that many because you happen to have the clubhouse, the swimming pool, and the, and the fields there that takes some density away from that. But if you consider it as a whole, it's still a high density project. And that's what has been mentioned over here. I'm not saying that it's strong enough necessarily to say that it doesn't meet the criteria. I'm just saying that's, those are the two things that really give me pause is the, the traffic, the, the, our, our street's capacity currently 7800 South and 5600 West to handle this, and the, uh, the medium density just still being 43 foot apartment buildings. That's all I have to say about that. Any other comments? Questions, concerns? I have comments. Ah, I have lots of 
technical difficulties tonight. I guess the bulbs burn out. Doesn't show up on my side. Yeah. <laughs> Try a different side. <laughs> uh, first, I do uh, just want to quickly address uh, Mr. Hanna and Mr. Moss. Thank you for coming in and, and voicing your comments, and also uh, the developers. I appreciate uh, all that, that both of you have brought to us. Um, just to uh, to let you know, there are there are members of the planning commission that live out in that area. I do, and uh, I'm definitely very uh, you know I, I want to see uh, what you want to see. I want to see that the city develops in a way that. That makes sense, and I want to see that um, that that area grows in a way that's responsible. Um, unfortunately, one of the one of the items um, is that for us to bring and encourage growth of, of commercial out there, which will uh, spur the economy and bring in the mixed use and things like that, that that uh, make a beautiful, wonderful city. Um, we do have to have uh, the rooftops to encourage those those groups to want to come out there. Um, but I, I just mainly wanted to address that that we do take your opinions and and we do weigh them most definitely. Uh, and we, we are residents of that area, so please understand that we're we're not making decisions idly. That's all. Any other comments? Commissioner Jacob? I just maybe a question for staff as far as I mean I rambled on about roads and stuff, but seventy eight hundred south obviously is not part of the scope of this development. They the developer in this case has no control over that couple hundred foot stretch that's two lanes. Um, where are we as a city on, on that piece of road? What can be done as far as connecting this uh, window ranch way to the roundabout on seventy eight? And I already asked about 56, so I'll just leave that one alone. But I know on 78, the, the city is uh, actively working on uh, acquiring property uh, for the widening of that. Uh, as far as design, I don't know, Nate, if it's gone to design yet, um, but they realize the problem. Um, unfortunately, we can only re we can't require a. a improvement outside of the boundaries of this. Now the Maverick uh, gas station will be on that corner and so maybe there, there's something that could be uh, worked out as far as connecting that small piece of property between the Maverick when that is developed and, and this, you know, and by that time maybe the other commercial will be developed on that corner anyway. Right. So, if I'm a druthers, I would like to see that, that window ranch road connect by the time, say, phase two was completed on this project, just to give another outlet. Yeah. Um, so. But I suppose that's probably not something we can add in as a condition of approval. Uh, no, not outside the boundaries of the, it. It would be an illegal exaction. I guess if we wanted to go to court, we could do that, but we don't. Certainly <laughs> won't do that. So. Well, I wasn't doing anything for it. Commissioner Rick? I, I was just going to say, I, I think I, I agree with you, uh, Commissioner Jacob, that. Uh, when it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, it probably is a duck. And and I have a hard time I have a hard time seeing how this is a uh, fits in a, you know an MFR. I know it's in the West Side residential or the West Side zoning <coughs> overlay, but I do have a hard, I, I have a, the same hard time with that. Is that this doesn't look like medium density where it ought to be medium density? But it is a permitted use. It is a permitted use. It just it does not. So if we consider this in the two different parts that it is, tell me what about phase one does not meet the criteria for medium density residential in the WSPA? You know, just just medium residential, just this looks like an apartment, it looks like high density. I, I, I mean, I get the number of units per acre, but it still looks like high density to me. So, I mean, it's just a, it's, it's the feeling. You know, based on the units per acre in that section, yeah, you're right. It's a... Uh, it, it meets the requirement, but it still looks like a high density because the way we stacked everything in and used the, the open areas. So, so this being a judicial item, it does require findings of fact. Yeah, I know it does. Refute the <laughs> fine right. criteria presented. Yes. I, think, I think the the other thing to consider here is that yes, it, it does look like high density, but 
but um, the developers have taken uh, into account and they have put high quality finishes on these elevations that would allow, um, I guess, not an eyesore, in my opinion. If I may. Please. Um, you're right, Commissioner Skuski, that it, they, they will look nice. They will be very nice looking apartment buildings. Um, you're right, Commissioner Green, they will look like apartment buildings. Um, Therefore, <laughs> therefore I, I, I feel kind of a little bit of a conundrum. You look at the future land use map. Um, I don't know if you want to pull that up real quick or not. But if you look at the future land use map and the zoning, where the median density is, and all, it's, it's, you carry it across 5600 West. You have high density on the north side of Clay Hollow Wash, and you have low density on, not low density, but median density, which in this case is single family homes, on, and they're nice homes, on the south side of Clay Hollow Wash there. Um, what it looks like ought to have happened on the future land use map is that that use carries across the street. It's one kind of continuum, like I said, you know, if we want to look at it. But, um, it's one kind of continuous little stretch of land that it looks like it, this should be the same. But this isn't the same. I, I, I see that it meets, you know, the technical definition, but the technical, the, the objective code does have some subjectivity written into it, as in it's consistent with the intent of the goals and policies of the general plan. Well, what is the intent and the goals and the policy of the general plan? Is it to allow for amenities in an apartment complex, or is it to allow for the same style of use that exists in the neighborhood in that zone? So it's a, um, it's a conundrum. I think, though, if you look at, um, at that land use map as well, um, where, where the charter school has come in, they've taken that whole uh, east section of that little spur there, and they've turned that into a big drainage pond. So if you were to put in medium density in that little section, uh, in a way it would look out of place compared to the rest of the development that would be going in. You just have one tiny little pocket. So, That's true too. I mean, you can kind of look at it from both angles. I do respect your opinion. I do respect what, you, what you're saying. I'm not sure what my opinion is. <laughs> I'm just talking. And is the Highlands, if you look at the Highlands Development Plan, really this, this 56, between 56 and the Mountain View Corridor was planned to be a buffer between the higher density Mountain View Corridor, which will be a freeway someday, you know, if the other jurisdictions ever complete their portions or if UDOT ever completes them, it will be a very busy road. And so in the general plan, it does state to, to buffer the lower intensity uses uh, from, you know, the Mountain View Corridor. As you can see to the north, um, it, as it kind of veers off to the northwest, then the lower density will, will come in again to in to play, but this is really a pinch point between two different types of residential, and so, um, you know, the low density, uh, you know, the general plan just calls to buffer it with higher density and commercial uses, and this is, you know, I believe what the Petersons have tried to do with the Highlands Development Plan, so. Commissioner Pat. Okay, unless I uh, Mr. Langford. Well, I just wanted to add really quickly, I, I'm very encouraged to hear the Commission uh, talk about our general plan and your familiarity with the general plan. That is very important. It's a, it's a really important advisory document that we need to base our criteria and findings on. Um, we need to look at it in different levels, though. Um, we've got our general plan, which is a guiding document, and then we have the Highlands Development Plan, which is a little more regulatory and that the die has been cast and the, the framework is set that that's already been adopted by by ordinance by by the our city council and so um hopefully in your discussions and, and you're, as you're weighing the criteria you can also put a, a lot of stock and credence in that approved uh, master develop, development plan so i just wanted to say that
Commissioner Beck. Great, thank you. And that's what I was going to mention. I, I was fortunate enough to sit on the General Plan Committee, and I know through the three years that we were on that, uh, a lot of public input was there. And every time that I have a staff report, I go right to the, the General Plan portion that's contained there just to make sure uh, how that is. And I, I like the discussion that, that we've had, and, and seeing as we, we, we've discussed over and over, and I, I think that we've um, covered just, just about all, all the bases. I guess I'd like to, to call a question and make a, a motion recommendation that based on the findings set forth in the staff report and the design show in the view of 5600 Sutterate Preliminary Development Plan, sorry, based on the findings set forth in the staff report and the design shown in the view of 5600 Sutter area preliminary development plan and upon evidence and explanation received today, I move that the Planning Commission approve the view of 5600 sub area preliminary development plan located at approximately 5600 west and 8200 south in the MFR zone for 51 units on 6.01 acres with a residential density of 8.50 units per acre and in the HFR zone. 480 units on 28.79 acres with a residential density of 16.7 units per acre subject to the five conditions of approval contained in the staff report as well as number six and seven from an addition that we received today that reads uh, number six, the development shall be designed according to city standards and shall have the approval of the city engineer before final approval is granted notwithstanding the design concepts as shown in the preliminary development plan. Number seven, a hawk signal shall be required at the location where the trail crosses 5600 West to protect the health and safety and welfare of residents. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pack, second by Commissioner Laws. Discussion to the motion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries six to one. Commissioner Beck. Thank you. I'd also like to move that based on the findings set forth in this staff report and upon the evidence and explanation received today, that the Planning Commission approve the view of 5600 preliminary subdivision plat located at approximately 5600 West, 8200 South, subject to the five conditions listed in the staff report. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pack, second by Commissioner Laws. Discussion to this motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Motion carries five to two. Last one, Commissioner Peck. Thank you. And based on the findings set forth in the staff report and upon the evidence and explanations received today, I move that the Planning Commission approve the view of 5600 preliminary site plan located at approximately 5600 West, 8200 South, subject to the three conditions contained in the staff report. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pack, second by Commissioner Laws. Discussion of the motion. I did have one question on this one. How are we going to enforce the uh, areas not maintained under the term of the Highlands Assessment Area uh, maintained in perpetuity by the property owner? How are we going to enforce that? Development agreement. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. Motion carries five to two. Concludes that item. Next item on our agenda is Utah Natural Milk. Conditional use permit for dairy operations in an A1 zone. Bull with livestock, uh, Randy Bowler is the applicant. Time is now yours. <coughs> Hello, my name is Shane Bowler, 7402 South, 5490 West in Worcester. Randy Bowler, 6663 South, 2200 West, West Jordan. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Pleasure to be here with you tonight. Appreciate your time. Uh, we've uh, reviewed the staff report and appreciate the favorable recommendation on our application. Just have one concern in that report, and that would be item number one, um, where it, uh, and I would read that and refer you to it. Uh, no more than 20 cows be allowed on the property at any given time. Um, if uh, that would be the case, 
this uh, request would not work for us due to the fact that uh, in addition to the milking cows that we'd have, we'd have dry cows and baby cows. And uh, so that uh, limit would not allow us enough milking cows to, to be viable for us. Uh, might mention that uh, I think the real factor there should be uh, just prudent business practice. As you're aware, we've operated in the city now for quite a few years. I think it's been successful. I think it's been viable for us as well as the neighborhood. And uh, so my recommendation there would be that uh, uh, we be reviewed periodically. In fact, that's condition number three. Uh, the condition use permit shall be subject to review and revocation as per section 13.70.10. We recognize that if at any point in time we're out of line or causing neighborhood issues, that the conditional use permit would be reviewed and subject to even revocation uh, if there were serious uh, impacts going on there. would also mention that uh, we will be regulated by the state and federal dairy regulations, which are very stringent. Uh, so that would just be my comments and request that uh, would be allowed to operate it on a prudent basis uh, and uh, certainly to be reviewed periodically. Would entertain any questions or comments that the commissioners would have? Uh, I have one. So you might have another one. Uh, this will be raw milk, correct? Yes, sir. That was really my only curiosity there. Commissioner Jacob. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit about what it goes from having cows on the property to having a dairy operation on the property. What? Because you already have cows, and cows are permitted, and you can have as many as you want. Right. So when we talk about a dairy operation, let's talk to me about what the difference is. I'm not a farmer. Uh, why don't you take that? Uh, so the real difference is just in the regulation as far as the state's concerned. Uh, dairy cows have to meet a grade A milk requirement, so they would have to have a milk parlor. <coughs> that meets those requirements from the state's point of view. That's to keep the milk safe, the cows clean, and all of that for consumers. As far as waste from the cows uh, or any other factor, there really isn't any difference between the beef cows. Uh, there's, there's really no difference between a Jersey cow, which we would milk, and an Angus cow, which we would use for beef. So there is no additional impact. We don't expect to have any additional head of cows on that property, merely, as you said, to convert them from beef to dairy cows. So we don't expect an impact there at all. The only change would be a small building that would be used as a milk parlor. That was my second question. Do you need any facilities improvement, that kind of thing, to make a dairy operation as opposed to a five-acre farm? If so is it, there's the milk facility, I guess? Yeah, so there will be a a barn where the cows will, will be, uh, well, they will walk in to be milked. As far as water requirements, there already has to be water for the, for cows on the property, so there won't be any that way. Uh, there will have to be probably a septic system, uh, which would be more of a health department issue that we'll have to deal with. But that would be uh, just wash water waste that will enter the septic system. There is no public sewer on that street. Thank you. So in a dairy operation, no difference in noise, no difference in smell, anything like that? Um, all I can say is if you cattle. can smell the difference between a dairy cow and a beef cow, you got me beef. No, I'm, just talking about <laughs> I'm talking about the, like the milk process. There, since this is raw milk, there's going to be no processing, anything like that, correct? Yeah. There won't be any processing there at all. Uh, it would be merely the milking of the cows. That milk will be contained as normal in a bulk tank within the milk parlor. Okay. There won't be any transportation in and out, if that's what you're talking about as far as the milk goes. Yes, I, I'm just trying to, I, I, I'm, with, I'm with Commissioner Jacob. I'm trying to figure out what the difference between a dairy operation and just having cows is, but that's, that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I just want to know if there's any extra noise, smell, light, anything like that that would cause concern. We don't expect any difference as far as the impact to the adjacent properties from what we've already done. Fisher Pack. Thank you. How many cows do you currently have on site? Currently on site we have, uh, I think, 10. 
10, 10 cows, and, and you say that the number of cows wouldn't change, you're just converting it from... So, yeah, you're going to hold me to that, aren't you, 10 cows? <laughs> <laughs> so our operation uh, is a rotational grazing, being as we do pastured organic beef currently. And so for the summertime, they are down at the ranch where we can graze them. We prefer that option. In the wintertime, there's more cows. And so seasonally, it will change. Today, there sits 10 cows. That, that varies quite a bit depending on the seasons, depending on the amount of water that we get, uh, the available grass. So. so how many would you say at, at a peak season? Because uh, as Mr. Bowler mentioned, 20 would stymie your operation, but yet you have 10 right now. So can, can you enlighten us? Yeah, so in discussions with Ray, we've talked about milking 20 cows, and that's probably where that number came from. The fact of the matter is if you count them by noses, you have cows that are milking, cows that are dry because they go through cycles. <clears throat> and then every cow, of course, has to have a calf to be able to give milk. And so limiting it to a maximum number of head really isn't seeing the whole picture, if that makes sense, on that operation. To be able to say we will never have more than X amount of cows is also a very limiting point of view because how, how do I know, you know, once in a while you will have a twin or something like that. Um, if we have to work within a limit to make the city happy, I think we can work that out. I would be more in favor of saying, in a common sense point of view, at least in my opinion, it doesn't benefit us and our business in any way to have a congestion of cows. For one thing, our customers would buy the milk because that's not the philosophy that we live by. And for a second thing, there would be enough complaints that we would be reviewed even if it was allowed. So whether that works for the city or not, I can't speak for that. But um, trying to put a number on something that's numberless is hard for me. So ballpark figure, you couldn't even give an estimate? So we if, we said, 40, if we said limit 20 cows in milk, that's something I can, I can okay. certainly fathom in my head, yes. OK, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gales? Thank you. Uh, as you'll recall, this property was rezoned from rural residential to agricultural here earlier this year. Um, that was the city council who reaffirmed that. Um, and it is correct that uh, there's a limited number of animals in the agricultural district. Uh, this is a, a conditional use in the agricultural zone, uh, dairy operations specifically. And so uh, what you need to base your finding, what you need to base your decision on is just findings that are in the report in terms of the number of cattle, um, just in crunching the numbers. I think even if the property were rezoned, um, I mean, we're under the rural residential district, they have up to 25 cows uh, at, at a time. So we would be opposed at all to. Is, uh, you know, either way, our, our, our concern is just for the residents and the impacts that, that it may have for that. So, um, you know, our recommendation is for approval, subject to whatever number you come up with on uh, the cows, if you so choose, and then the other two items that are listed in your staff report. I have one question, probably for our legal counsel that's here tonight. Uh, nuisance ordinances and agricultural zones, they still apply, don't they? As far as if there's excessive noise, excessive smell, excessive whatever, they have a loud party and want to stay up all night with the cows, um, and the neighbors can hear it, do nuisance ordinances still apply to, to an agricultural zone in one way or another? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, could you summarize that for me? Thank well, you. if I could follow up on that, what was the change we made a couple of years ago regarding agricultural nuisances when they abutted other properties? My, it's been a couple of years. So, maybe, am, I, am I making this up? That's what I was asking. So, it was in my mind. Looks like Mr. Bowler might know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, so, I'm not totally. Out in left field with this. That, that's what brought the question to mind. Is I, I don't remember what we did with it. It's been long enough that I don't recall exactly what we what we changed or if we actually did change it. But I thought we did, but it wasn't going to impact new agriculture. It would only be 
the ones that were previously existing. And again, this is me getting old. That's been a couple. No, of years. I, I, think, I seem to recall the same thing. And it Anybody got a solid out of the code? My dad died, so I can't be sure. on the legal opinion. If, if yes. I could, uh, Mr. Chair, um, under Title uh, Five, Five Dash Three Dash Two, which is our nuisance ordinance. Uh, the following activities are exempted from the definition of nuisance and will not be subject to the city enforcement action. Um, let's see. Pre-existing farms and ranches under Section B. Uh, the definition of nuisance shall not apply to those properties and portions of, or, and portions of properties engaged in acti active agricultural ranch operations continu continuously dating from before uh, the surrounding land was developed into the current residential or commercial uses. Active agricultural ranch operations includes, but is not limited to, sights, sounds, odors, and dust inherent to raising crops, livestock, and livestock products. So, so seeing as this was just rezoned earlier this year, does right. it meet the pre-existing? There was still those operations on the property, but it wasn't an agricultural zone at the time. Right, not knowing the historical context of the, the site, I would have to do a little more digging and research into that. So, so if there was a pre-existing business license for that kind of activity, could that be a... I don't know if it's based on the underlying zone or if just the activity was present or a combination of both. I would, well, I'm not a, a legal person, but to me, the way that the verbiage is, it it talks about the activity more than it talks about the zone. And uh, the pre-existing is the key there. This yeah. it would it would seem to to uh, hmm. yeah. chop the legs out from under this particular use in any case. Excellent. Which makes it, of course, easier to milk. Sorry. Hi. Sorry. It's been a long night. Any <laughs> <laughs> other questions for staff? Hearing none, uh, open this item to the public. Uh, once again, you'll have three minutes if you would kindly give your name and contact information. Yes, uh, my name is Lynn Heward. I'm an attorney for the owners of the property at, uh, just north of this, uh, 7374 South, 5490 West. In other words, I guess you have the, the three parcels that have been zoned agricultural. And then there's uh, one parcel north of that, and then the parcel north of that is the one that... And, of course, that one has a residence. Uh, unlike... The, I guess there was a question as to what that piece was look, used for before. Uh, it was zone agriculture, and, of course, it was recently acquired by the bowlers. It was not... It was vacant. It was not being used for things, as I understand it, before. It was owned by the Atkins, and they were planning to sell it for residential development, but that what didn't work because of the... Uh, the fact that there were pigs being raised on the property to the north. And I think my clients to this, as it understands that that's the way the city wants to do it, is have a kind of an oasis of agriculture, and so he may well be coming in here asking for his property to be his own agriculture as well. But unfortunately, he still lives there and would like to not have the, uh, the you know, his living conditions degraded too much. And uh, unfortunately, I remember that in this, either in this uh, committee or commission, or before the council, someone mentioned that they lived close to a, a dairy and were surprised at the number of flies and so on that existed. And uh, and I think it was either here or there that they talked about the fact that, you know, asked if pigs would be asked for again, and they were assured that it would not. But I have them hard pressed to understand why it would be better to have. Uh, a dairy conditional use than a pig's conditional use. But at any rate, uh, I reviewed some of these ordinances that exist in other places across the country. Uh, for example, in Redlands, California, it said that there would be a maximum of two uh, dairy cows per, per acre. And of course, that would translate to less than 10 here. In uh, Fulton, Georgia, they said it had to be 200 feet from the lot line, which would mean that the dimensions would have to be more than 400 feet each way, and the north and south is only 250. In Midlands, Michigan, they talked about uh, 20 acres minimum for a dairy. Here we have less than five. 
in Omaha, Nebraska, it couldn't be within a half mile of residential area. And of course, there's residential to the east, residential plan that I guess abuts three of the residential lots that are planned for across 5600 South. And uh, they were not even, people were not even notified by mail within a half mile, uh, let alone the prohibition against that. So I think there are reasons for these rules, and so I would ask that this uh, dairy be denied. Thank you. Does anybody else like to comment on this? Hi, my name is Charles Eric Pemberton. I live at 8377 South, 3580 West for 30 years. Um, I'm a customer of Utah Natural Meats. I've been at other dairy operations. This particular dairy, or it's not a dairy now, but this particular site is very clean. When you go to the store, which is not hard, with, of the area. I'm not sure if you've ever been there. They have a little red barn. You go in and they have these freezers. You purchase your meat there. But all around that area where they have their animals, you can't really smell them at all. And so those who are concerned about scent, flies, um, you really don't have that. He has two semi-truck, um, what do you call it, trailers that he grows his grass in and feeds his cattle and his chickens with. Um, and he's even had people come from France to take a look at his operations. I was there the day the guy from France was there. And so, um, and there's also a growing need for this type of service. Uh, I, I see a growing need throughout the community. That's the reason why you have certain certain locations in this valley that people sell whole milk or raw milk. But um, I'm all in favor that they have them have their dairy. There's a growing need and it's a clean operation. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Hyatt, 9313 Copper Lane, West Jordan. Um, I just want to go on record saying that I'm really happy that there's a favorable recommendation for this. Um, I love the Bowlers Farm. Uh, it's got products that we need there and that I go 18 miles an hour round trip to get at the moment. I'd be really happy to have those back in West Jordan where I can get them close and convenient. Um, I know there's zoning issues and, you know, I wouldn't want to you don't have a pig rendering farm next to me suddenly pop up where I live in my residential area. But um, on the other hand, you know, you, you've got to grow. You've got to go with what people want. And right now, people want their products. Uh, this is really getting on my nerves. <laughs> people um, want their products. In my circle, I, I don't know how many. We spend hundreds of dollars a year on what they sell and that I have to get up in Salt Lake is what they're trying to sell their raw milk. And I have several friends who are doing the same thing. So it's it's this is a very, very popular thing. And you know, if the whole place was zoned rural and all of a sudden we had lots of people, we realized that it would need to be zoned commercial in some areas and we'd have to recognize that things are growing and changing and that's part of being in a community. And so um it, they run their farm so responsibly. They've got genius ways of watering the feed for their animals that doesn't waste any water. They're so conscientious, really proud of the bowlers, and I, I just support this decision and hope that they'll grant them that um, conditional use permit. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Kristen Whitaker. I live at 7341 Tico Drive. You can see my house um, is not adjacent to their farm, but you can, you can see it from my yard. Um, and I'm very familiar with the operation there. I have the privilege of working, helping out twice. I'm not much help, but I go and participate twice a week actually milking cows, so I have real hands-on experience with cows. Um, I actually wanted to bring some impressive statistics about 
grass-fed open-air dairies versus commercial cows that people might be afraid of. I Googled dairy air to find some stats, and I don't recommend doing that. But I know what neighbors are afraid of when they think a dairy is coming, because on a recent drive to Nebraska, we drove past a a dairy farm, and the smell was so acrid it woke my kids up. Like, I know what people are afraid of, and they're afraid it's going to be noisy. I can attest that the smell is not an issue. When you're working on a small scale like they are, with an appreciation and an awareness for the land and a respect for the animals and how they thrive, the land is able to absorb the odors, and I can't smell them from my house. I can smell the neighbor's goats, and I can smell their barbecue. I can't smell the cows, and when I'm there, I literally have to be under the cow when an event occurs to smell the impact, you might say. And as far as noise goes, cows are quiet. I know we have an operating goat dairy in West Jordan, which I use and I appreciate, and it's a little on the loud side. Cows are very quiet. I would sign a petition to get rid of my neighbor's schnauzers before I was concerned about the cows on the Bullers Farm. I really appreciate the diversity that they offer and that the city has done as much as they have to support the viability of their business. I mean, we've just witnessed the expansion of the housing going in and the population closing in, and things are starting to look the same, you know, apartment developments and McDonald's and grocery stores. It's really a gem to have a resource like this within our city boundaries. I've lived in West Jordan for 10 years. I was first five years more central down by the post office on 32 where I had light pollution and noise, and I moved west so I could have more of a rural feel. And I really value that we have animals close by to where people live. I would call that an amenity when people are looking to purchase here. Hey, look, kids, we can see cows. They have babies. They've calved. Look at the piglets. People drive far to see the Bullers animals, and it's really enriched my family. And I wanted to express my appreciation for the support that they've given for the diversity and the enriching influence the Bullers are in our house, are in our community, and to just have you please consider this license. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. My name is Joshua Stockwell. I live in Sandy. Do you want my address, my phone number? It's 1640 East, 11245 South in Sandy, Utah. I have a lot of patients that are customers of the dairy, or what is looking to be the dairy, Utah Natural Meats. I consume their products. And I stand here really to represent mammals as a whole, the 50 billion or so that are on this planet. Mammals are named such because they have mammary glands. And mammary glands, of course, are used to feed the youth sometimes for years, solely on what comes out of those mammary glands. And once that's out of the animal, and it is denatured and processed, it becomes a different product. The pasteurized milk that we see on the shelves at our grocery store that sells for small, small amounts of money per gallon, because it's subsidized and produced on very big commercial places like the young lady just described to you, that product is a very, very dirty product, not only in dirt or in pus, but in a lot of drugs and antibiotics and stuff that are used, that are necessary to keep the place clean because they're just such dirty organizations. This is not what they are applying for. The availability of raw milk is very, very low here in the state of Utah, and it's a very, very prized commodity and the popularity of it is growing and growing and it's nutritional quality what it can do as opposed to what's on the shelves in the grocery stores. It's unheard of. The science is very, very sound in that if you feed a calf pasteurized milk, it is very, very sick. The organs are a completely different color. The stomach is full of very foul smelling gunk when they kill these calves that are raised on pasteurized milk. But if you feed an animal raw milk 
that it thrives and it's strong and its bones and its facial features are all full and set. The nutrition is very, very rich. So just for that fact alone and that they're able to offer that as a dairy here, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I'd rather run right over here to West Jordan and go up to Sugar House and get it up from Real Foods that's up there. That's the other place that offers it. Anyway, um, if the community around that farm knew of the value of the foods that are sold there, which at some point they, they will hopefully, then there would be no question as to whether or not it would be a good thing for everybody. I definitely am for it. And I ask you please to approve their license for dairy. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I'll repeat the last call. Ooh, here we go. Keep them coming. <laughs> Yeah. My name is Bree Cornell, 5711 West Discovery Drive, and I live just yonder northwest of this proposed location. I'm a beekeeper, have been for a number of years, and I moved to West Jordan three years ago so that I could have my bees in an agricultural, rural community like what you've established here in West Jordan. It was very appealing for my husband and I to move here because we could see what we believed you were building. And so this has my full support in continuing that vision and going forward to have a mix of agriculture, a mix of families living in high density areas, an organization like Smith's coming in and building a beautiful facility that they have, continued growth and development, but a mix of everything. I've been raised on a farm and a ranch operation since very young. And it's very true, the density of the animals, how they're handled, makes a big difference on the nuisance that can be introduced or avoided. This has my full support. I don't need to go take my full three minutes here. But please, consider. This is a favorable thing for the community. It's why I moved here. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Albert Smith. I live at 8245 South, uh, 3475. Not got that wrong, but anyway, <laughs> I wish. Oh, I would be him. And I don't really live near this area, but I heard about this meeting and I thought, why are we trying to zone a farm that's in an area that's already agriculture, you know? I mean, that would be like the government deciding which business will succeed. And I'm not really sure I agree that the city should condemn one business and let another business. You know, people seem to be in favor of this, so I agree with the people. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Webster. I'm at uh, 1819 East 13200 South in Draper, so I'm not a West Jordan resident, but I have been a customer of the bowlers for since they've opened up their operation. And I agree with what else has been said, that they run a clean operation. I, I, I go there regularly. I buy their products. I come to West Jordan and spend my money. Uh, Shane and Kristen are everybody that is the customer loves them. They run a clean operation. They're super conscientious about the product they put out. And so I hope you to, I, I also hope you support them and, and uh, approve, approve this. And it, I think it's an asset to us, Jordan, because this is an industry that's growing. More and more people want clean, healthy, local food. So I think it's an asset to the community. And thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, this will be the last time I call, last call. <laughs>
have 30 more seconds? Yeah. <laughs> one one per customer. Very well. We'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Green button. Green. <laughs> <laughs> My lights out. Commissioner Scott. I think uh, one thing that that we have to do as a commission is is look not only at, at what public sentiment is, but also um, providing a sustainable environment for the future of West Jordan and. Uh, I really think that what Bowler's have done uh, in West Jordan, clearly from all of the comments, has provide a really uh, not only an alternative uh, setting to buy meat and potentially dairy products, but they've also provided um, growth for West Jordan in a sustainable way. They're they're managing their product on that small site, and they're doing so in a very uh, efficient way and I think that honestly is to be commended. Uh, I think I think that's something that our industry has lacked. I think it's something that uh, moving towards the future uh, of development uh, needs to be incorporated more in this type of mixed use where the you know not only is it is it a valuable operation for West Jordan, the citizens obviously love it and uh, I just, I really think that it's to be commended, and I, I'm 100% behind this. That's my opinion. Commissioner Back. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I agree with Commissioner Sikowski. I, I was going to say the same thing. I, I've driven past the operation, especially, um, well, a, a few different times. I've gotten out of the car, I've checked things out. Uh, I, I agree with what's been mentioned tonight regarding no odorous odor. And also at the cleanliness. I'm not a farmer either, but I've been to other farms, and I'd have to say this is the cleanest farm that I've seen. Trisha, uh, great. Now, 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 you, now you derail my train of thought. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for, for uh, taking the time to, to be here tonight. Uh, I. I, I refer back, I, I think Commissioner Pack, you talked about the general plan earlier. I think that the, uh, the number one part of this uh, that we need to take a look at is what Jordan historically has always been farms. And unfortunately, I have to tell you, when I moved, when I moved into my yard, it had pheasants from the old farm that was there that, that the developer took out to put my house in. And I really didn't want to put a backyard in, in because the kids love running out in the weeds with the pheasants. So I, I understand the agricultural uses of the, of the city, and, and I think we need to, to foster that environment where agriculture can coexist with an urbanized area. And to be honest with you, I can't figure out the, the difference between a dairy operation and cows. We talked about that a little bit earlier. But I, I can't see the difference of having cows on the property and having a dairy operation on the property. I, I think that the conditional use permit is is an acceptable use. I, I think that I know that we had some um, some information presented on other city ordinances, but that they're not West Jordan, and and they don't apply to West Jordan, unfortunately. And so at this point, I, I'd have to say that I, I support this conditional use permit as well. Mr. Jacob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. Excuse me. Um, I want to echo what, what pretty much everybody else has been saying. Um, now, reality is in 10 years, 20 years, there probably won't be a farm here just because the city is growing. The city is growing rapidly. The city is rapidly encroaching on this area. Um, and so eventually, just like there's no farm by Commissioner Green's house anymore, there will probably not be a farm here, but right now there is. And right now, he can have cows on it. And whether or not he milks the cows is the subject of this question. That's, that's the only question we have before us tonight, is whether or not you reach under there and get your milk. So the impact on the neighborhood is not different. The impact on the, uh, on the, the business itself, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a moot point to me, it seems almost silly that we have to prove it. Sir, I thought I'd motion sir. No. I, I was going to make it, but if you're going to, go ahead. I would be happy to. 
Uh, one thing I wonder, though, is if they're trading out the, the beef cattle for the dairy cattle, will there be, will be a run on grass-fed beef? Probably. Uh, okay. uh, on that note, uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we uh, approve the conditional use permit to allow for dairy operations for property located at 7482 South, 5490 West, in an A1 zoning district uh, with conditions 2 and 3, striking condition 1. Second. Motion by Commissioner Law, second by Commissioner Jacob. Discussion to the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7 to 0. <coughs> Brings us to our last public hearing for the evening. Uh, Farmers Insurance Rezone. Looking to rezone 0.3 acres from RR1A to SC1 and approximately 0.7 acres from RR1A to R110D. Kit Erickson is the applicant. Is the applicant present? Good evening. My name is Kit Erickson. I am the owner of the property at A732 South Redwood Road. The property is currently zone residential and has been for some time. Um, all of the properties directly to the north of it that face Redwood Road um, have been rezoned commercial without application just because they, they fit that way within the city's land use map. My property also uh, fits that way within the city's future land use map. It's my personal opinion that it probably should have been converted at the same time as my neighbors were. And without having to go through the process, but here we are. So the plan is to convert the home that is existing there into a business. Uh, we'll maintain the same home. The uh, home would just be converted from a, a residence <coughs> into an office. Um, there would be very minimal uh, difference as, as far as any neighbor could perceive. Um, there's very minimal traffic that would be involved. We get on a busy day four or five cars that come in parking lot. Um, there would be the difference as far as <coughs> signage out on the property, but once again where it's on Redwood Road, it, it would hardly be noticeable because of the traffic and the light that's already there. It fits more with the feel of Redwood Road to have that be a business as opposed to a residence. So I hope that you can approve it as such. Questions are happening? I'm getting by I've got to ask. You might have the same question I do. Go for it. So my question is, have you started conducting business there? Yes. Okay, so then my follow-up question is why, without having a property zone? I uh, lost my lease at the office that I was in previously. Okay. That's the question issue. Not quite. But go ahead. My question is, do you live there? No, sir. Okay. That, that was my other question. So your business license is like a, a normal, not a home occupation business license, just a regular business license? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Very well. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Callis. Thank you. Just a couple of points of clarification. Uh, there was a rezoning rec <coughs> proposal that was uh, approved years ago for the SC1 and the R110D to the north. It wasn't just just zoned that way. Um, there were <clears throat> and uh, this property is kind of a remnant. The frontage along Redwood Road got what we call a Redwood Road corridor overlay district. It's a, it's an overlay zoning district. Uh, it doesn't show up on this map, but it's basically every uh, lot. It's it's one lot deep um, off of Redwood Road, so this entire parcel would fall within that. And the <clears throat> um, it was designed uh, with this type of property specifically in mind uh, to be able to, feel, to uh, allow people um, to convert those older homes to, to office space. So even under the, uh, the Red Road Overlay District, um, converting the residence that's there now to an office would be a permitted use. Um, this request is will change that I'll just show you here. This is the future land use map along Redwood Road. There's a, an area here that's just shown for uh, neighborhood commercial. This right here is, uh, 
is slated for uh, residential. And <clears throat> to fit with that, uh, the front part of the zone, uh, the front part of the property would be, <coughs> my mic is cut out, um, would be rezoned from R1A to SE1 to fit with the property that's to the north. And then uh, the back part of the property, uh, this would be zoned from R1A to R110D. We think that it's, uh, it's a good fit, it follows the master plan. Uh, so we don't have any objections to uh, proceeding with rezone. Mr. Dick, last question? I, I always have a question. Just one big constant question. I might as well be the Riddler. Uh, question for you, though. The um, use, the insurance office that's there, um, is a permitted use in an SC1, correct? It's not initial use or anything else like a, I don't know, for some reason, Professional office came to mind when I thought insurance office, but I just wanted to make sure that we weren't having to redo it again. So, thank you. Good point. Any other questions for staff? Very well. We've lost most of our public, but uh, I am happy to open this up if there's anybody who would like to comment on this particular item. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Mr. I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, <coughs> based on the findings of the staff report and the discussion this evening. I move that we forward a positive recommendation to the City Council to rezone the property at 8732 South Redwood Road from an RR1A Rural Residential Zone to the SC1 Neighborhood Commercial and R110D Zoning Districts. Second. Motion by Commissioner Dick, second by Commissioner Quinn. Any discussion of the motion? Uh, uh, just for the record, I will be voting no on this particular application for the sole purpose that the, this planning commission is uh, ratifying uh, something that should have been, what I appear should have been uh, applied for beforehand. The sign's already up, it's not an SC zone, business has already been occupied in violation of, uh, of, of uh, Chapter 13 of the ordinance. So just for the record, that's why I'm voting for against this particular motion. Just to clarify, uh, is it within the purview of the, the Planning Commission to enforce city code outside of reviewing conditional use permits? Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries 6 to 1. Which concludes our agenda for this evening, which might be one of the longest agendas we have seen in quite some time. This is a short agenda, but it's a long uh, It was nice to, to see the level of public comment that we got to see. Absolutely. Uh, anything else we want to talk about? Or is anybody else want to Move to adjourn. I'm thinking a milkshake.